great to be back. And uh, we always feel like we're coming home here. I just want to say to you this morning, I looked over the congregation and thought, thank God for precious people. And uh, we need to appreciate one another. So uh, thank Pastor Sean and Karen in their absence for the privilege of being able to share here. And uh, I want to start off by saying that uh, 20 years ago, we had Steve Jobs, we had Johnny Cash, and we had Bob Hope. <laughs> Today, we have no Jobs, no Cash, and no Hope. <laughs> and and uh, I, I have to say, I cannot offer you a job this morning. I cannot give you cash, but I can bring you hope. Amen. Amen. And that's what we need in these desperate times. We really need that quality of hope. Now, if you look at 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 13, it gives us the three strong forces that should operate in the life of a believer. And it says that there are three things that remain, faith, hope, and love. We need faith, hope, and love. Now, let me quickly check whether you do have faith, hope, and love. If you have come this morning to hear a good sermon, that means you have faith. If you're still listening to me halfway through the sermon, that means you have hope. <laughs> if you stay right to the end and you've come back for a second time, that means you have love. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we often hear, and rightfully so, sermons on love because love is the greatest. And uh, there are often sermons and teachings on, on faith because we live by faith. But I do feel that hope is sometimes neglected in our preaching. And if there is a quality that we need right now, as I said, it's, it's hope. Uh, and some people don't really even understand what real hope is. So I'm going to share a few thoughts on hope today. And I hope that it'll give you a better understanding of hope. I've chosen uh, this title for my sermon, The Rope of Hope. And I want to read a key verse about hope from the Bible that's kind of connected with a rope. Uh, and I, I'll come back to the scripture in Hebrews 6, verses 18 and 19. It says, hold on to the hope we have been given. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, sure and strong. So very interesting, the Bible here likens hope to an anchor, but we all know that an anchor is useless without a rope. You, you need that rope connected to it, and I want to show you how to make that connection with this anchor of hope. I'm going to use this, uh, this metaphor of, of making a rope, and I want to put a spiritual spin to it. No pun intended. <laughs> because if you, if you make a rope, you have to spin some, some yarns, some fibers together. So very interesting, uh, if, if you want some homework, the Hebrew word uh, uh, tikva could mean hope or rope. So there's the, the connection there. And the, the word really means to bind together by twisting. So I'm going to show you how to, how to, and maybe I shouldn't use the word twist because some people will twist what I'm going to say. So let me rather use the word braiding, how to braid a rope of hope. Uh, and here's the first strand in building and making that rope of hope you need to define what hope is. 
because if you have the wrong concept of hope, you'll be working on the wrong thing and it will not produce the right result. So what is hope? I want to uh, answer some basic questions and this is the first one, what define what hope is, what is hope? And if I can give you a basic answer, it's this, hope has to do with the unseen and the future. And all of us have an idea of what hope is, and you can go to the dictionary, but I have found that even some of the concepts that the world would have of hope uh, do not agree with what the Bible says about hope. So we're obviously going to, to go to the Bible and we're going to look at what real hope is. And uh, let me give you some false concepts of hope, first of all. The first one is this, hope is not wishful thinking. Because you'll see that a whimsical wish is an assumption without any foundation. But the Bible gives us a very strong foundation for hope. I remember years ago, there was something called the Rhodesian sweep. Don't know if there's anybody in my category of age that can remember the Rhodesian sweep. It's like the lotto today. And there was a, there was a, a kind of tradition in the church that I grew up in. They used to ask people in the service, does anybody have an unspoken request? And then people would put their hands up. Now, I understand what they, what they, trying, what they were trying to do, but I've, I've learned that sometimes an unspoken request deserves an unspoken answer. But in any case, there was this old lady who put up her hand every Sunday. And one Sunday, the pastor took courage and he, he decided, today I'm going to ask her what her request is. And he said, when she put her hand up, sister, would, would you mind to tell us what your request is? And she stood up and she said, pastor, I, I'm praying that I would win the Rhodesian sweep. And he was kind of taken aback with the answer. Uh, but he said to her, do, do you have a ticket? She said, no, but nothing is impossible with God. <laughs> now, that's wishful thinking. Uh, and, and, and even today, when you play the lotto, you have two chances, slim and none, of winning that lotto. And, uh, and, and, and you know that the old payoff line uh, for the lotto used to be tata my chance. And I didn't know what it, what it meant. I thought it meant tata my chance, tata my money, tata my everything. <laughs> because that's really what, what happens. Uh, and the thing, the thing with people, most people playing lotto, they hope they win, but it's wishful thinking. And that's not what the Bible is speaking about. The second false concept is that hope is not a daydream. You see, uh, a daydream is often delusionary, uh, and uh, it's, uh, let me put it this way, I want to read what I wrote here. It's, an, it's not an airy-fairy flight of fancy to an egg castle in some fantasy fool's paradise of La La Land where you sigh for a pie in the sky someday by and by. <laughs> That's what a daydream is all about. But worldly hope is not just a daydream, it's often a pipe dream. And a pipe dream refers to something that is a fanciful aspiration, it's unattainable. In fact, the term pipe dream literally comes from the experience of smoking opium. That's a pipe dream. And when you, when you do smoke opium, you have high hopes. <laughs> but it's a pipe dream. The third false concept of hope is hope is not hype. You see, hype is an exaggerated attempt to make something look better or more exciting than what it really is. The Bible doesn't give us hype. It gives us 
hope based on reality, the reality of God's word. And then lastly, hope is not passive waiting. Now don't misunderstand me, there is a waiting involved in hope but it's not a passive waiting. In fact, hope is more awaiting something and not just waiting. Because awaiting means you are expecting something. You have anticipation for something to change and therefore hope is never passive or inactive. It should, like faith, have corresponding uh, confessions and actions. Amen. So trusting God uh, does not mean that you wait passively for, for something and you just grin and bear it and uh, you, you kind of avoid uh, confrontation and corrective action in, in a situation. Listen what uh, David said. He was a man in crisis when he wrote this, but he was a man of hope. Psalm 25 and verse 5, he says to the Lord, for you... You only and all together do I wait expectantly all the day long. Then in verse 20, he says, keep me, Lord, deliver me. Let me not be ashamed or disappointed for my trust and my refuge are in you. And the next verse, at the end of the verse, he says, for I wait for and expect you. That's what hope is about. It's awaiting in anticipation the activation of God's assurances. That's what hope is about. Let me give you a, a definition of what I believe biblical hope is. Listen to this. It's a favorable and confident expectation from the Lord and assured trust in the Lord of good things based on the secure Certainty of his promises. Wow. What a beautiful definition of hope. And uh, I, I was surprised when I looked up in the dictionary, I actually saw one dictionary that, that stated that the meanings of confidence and trust attached to hope are actually archaic. Wow. Now, it's interesting, the New Testament Greek word for hope is the word elpis. And I think for many people today, that um, th this statement is true. Elpis has left the building <laughs> because they lost hope. And that Greek word is a beautiful word. Listen what, it, what the verb means. To anticipate what is good, usually with joy and delight. To look forward with confidence to that which is good and beneficial. To assuredly expect to welcome. That's what true biblical hope is all about. And I like this acronym that I found for hope. Have only positive expectation. H-O-P-E. Have only positive expectation. And here's another one that is quite relevant. Hold on, pandemic ends. Amen. So our hope is built on the word of God, and that's what it's about. Let me get to a second twine that you need in this rope of hope, and that is discern when hope is needed. Now, when do we need hope? Well, we need hope all the time, but specifically in hopeless situations. I like the scripture in Romans 4 where it says that Abram hoped against hope. And hope, as I said, has to do with what is unseen and the future. Sometimes it's the immediate future, sometimes the distant future, like Abram had to wait 25 years, he hoped. And sometimes, listen to this, it even has to do with eternity. And so it's important to realize that our ultimate hope as a Christian is not just about this world. It's about eternity. Listen what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. We know it as the resurrection chapter. Verse 19, he says this. If our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. 
So if your hope is only about earthly things, then you've got the wrong kind of hope. He says you are to be pitied more than anybody else. It's about eternity. And then when he writes to Titus, he speaks about our blessed hope in Titus 2.13. He says, we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then Peter speaks about uh, this eternal hope, and he calls it our living hope in 1 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4. He says, in God's great mercy has caused us to be born again into a living hope because Christ rose from the dead. Now we hope for the blessings God has for his children, these blessings which cannot be destroyed or spoiled or lose their beauty are kept in heaven for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So even if any, everything else on earth fails, we still have hope. Amen. Hallelujah. But let me talk about the situation that we're currently facing here on earth, the crisis. And as I said, many people are without hope. And I did say hope is about the future, but hope is actually also about right now. Because when you lose hope, you, you become passive, you become, you don't dream anymore, you don't have any anticipation. So hope can make your present life better. I want to quote a man by the name of Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was a Jew, a Holocaust survivor in World War II. He wasn't a believer. He was into humanistic psychology, but I do believe we can learn a lot from what he said. And here's his observation. When he was in that Nazi concentration camp, he observed that the prisoners who survived were not the fittest. They were not the, the physically strong people. But those who survived were those who maintained a sense of hope. And, 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 and he said this, their hope helped them to deal with their present circumstances. And he, he said that you can, even in the gloomiest of situations and locations, have hope if you have meaning and purpose in your life. Now, just incidentally, World War II lasted six years. We just entered the third year of what we are experiencing right now. But, but he survived there. And as Christians, let me say this. We should have a lot more hope because Christ is the one who came and gave meaning to our life. Amen. Can I say it this way? The key to coping is hoping. Not moping. I love the scripture in Hosea 2 and verse 15, and it's something that, that really be became alive to me uh, during lockdown, because here God is speaking to Israel while uh, uh, their situation was not great, and he said this to them, I will transform the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. Wow. Wow. God is going to transform this pandemic into something that will give you hope for the future. Amen. So let me give you a third chord for your hope. And I'm not concluding yet, so don't get your hopes up. But yes, here's a third strand that you need. Determine the source of hope. Where can we find hope? Where does it come from? Now, in the last century, there was a, a well-known French philosopher, uh, and he was a proponent of what is called in philosophy absurdism. Now, absurdism is a theory about the so-called absurd conflict between looking for meaning in life and the inability to find any value in a seemingly purposeless world. So, no wonder they call it absurdism. And I'm not going to mention this guy's name, 
First of all, I don't want to make him notorious. Secondly, I want to protect the guilty. But here's what he said, and I don't agree with this statement, but I'm going to uh, uh, give it to you in any case. He said, where there is no hope, it is incumbent on us to invent it. I have news for him. God invented hope long ago. And it's not up to us to invent hope. Because God is the inventor. He's the source of hope. And I like Romans 5 where uh, 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 Paul speaks about a hope and he calls it the hope of the glory of God. And in, in verse 2 of Romans 5 he says, What incredible joy bursts forth within us as we keep on celebrating our hope of experiencing God's glory. But that's not all. Even in times of trouble we have a joyful confidence knowing that our precious will develop uh, 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 in us, patient endurance, and patient endurance will define, will refine our character, and proven character leads us back to hope. And this hope is not a disappointing fantasy because we can now experience the endless love of God cascading into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. That's a scripture that you need to go and read again and again. So God is the source of hope, and he speaks about this, this fountain within us. Uh, in in, in a, a further chapter, in chapter 15, Paul says this in verse 13, May God, the inspiration and fountain of hope, fill you to overflowing with un containable joy and perfect peace as you trust in Him. And may the power of the Holy Spirit surround your life with His superabundance. Wow. And then He says, until you radiate with hope. So God is the source. The Holy Spirit will, will uh, create that hope within you. Uh, in the preceding verse, he speaks about the, uh, the Messiah, and he says, an heir to David's throne will emerge. And then he speaks about all the nations. He says, their hopes will be met in him. He will give the nations hope. Amen. Jesus is called our hope. 1 Timothy 1, verse 1, the Lord Jesus our hope. Colossians 1, 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Somebody put it this way. They said, life with Christ is an endless hope. Life without Christ is a hopeless end. You need Jesus. And when Paul writes to the Ephesians uh, in, in chapter 2, here from verse 12 onwards, he describes their previous condition, and he says, and I'm not going to read all of it. You can go and read it at home. He says, you were without God and without hope. So let me put it this way, and you need to, to see it uh, uh, so that, that you can, it can make sense. If you do not have God, no God, no hope. But if you do know God, no God, K-N-O-W, and no hope. Amen. So God is the source of hope, and the cross of Christ is the cradle of hope. Please don't put your hope in your own abilities. Don't put your hope in anybody else. And, and while Sean is not here, I can say it. Don't put your hope in your pastor. Or in your medical doctor. Or your bank manager. Or whoever. Not in politicians. Your hope must be in God. Amen. And I'm sure you, like me, you might have during lockdown felt like you were under house arrest. <laughs> you couldn't leave your house. Now, listen to this. Israel, they were not just feeling that they were under house arrest. They were actually taken captive and they were in a foreign land. And in that time, here's what God says to them. And there's some people that say we should not uh, apply this verse 
for us today. Please, it just tells me about God's character, who he is, and he hasn't changed. And here's what he says, Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. I'm claiming that for me. If you, if you say it's not for us, whatever you believe. But I claim that for myself. And then when Israel's uh, um, exile eventually ended after 70 years, because this was spoken to them in exile, God spoke through another prophet in uh, Zechariah 9, 11 and 12. He says, because of the blood covenant uh, uh, of my blood, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I'll free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, O prisoners of hope. You might be a prisoner, but there's hope. Amen. He says, even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. I like what the, uh, what the message paraphrase is. He calls them hopeful prisoners. And then he says, God says, I'm declaring a double bonus. Everything you lost returned twice over. I'm claiming that for me. Amen. So here's what David says. My hope is in you. We, we, we saw that. But I wanna, want you to listen to these words of David. They are very significant. Psalm 130. I like this. Verses 5 to 7. I'm just going to read verse 5. And he says this. I wait upon you, expecting your breakthrough, for your word brings me hope. I tell you why some people have lost hope, even Christians, because they've neglected God's word. Your word brings me hope, says David. And it's because we don't have the word that we do not have hope. And it's confirmed in the New Testament. Again, Romans 15 and verse 4, Paul says, whatever was written in former days, that's the Old Testament was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Amen. God's Word will produce hope. Here's the final strand for your rope of hope. Discover how hope works. How does it operate in our lives? Let me, let me again emphasize this. Spend time with God's word. Fill your heart with hope. And, uh, you know, Cora and I made a decision at the beginning of lockdown. We switched our TV off. We didn't watch TV, I think, for six months. We knew if there was any news, our family would tell us about it. We just decided we're going to focus on God's word. And that is so important. And, and, and you know, some people said, well, you're an ostrich with your head in the sand. No, I'm an eagle with my future in his hand. I'm, I'm focusing on him. So I said to you last week, don't, don't look at your phone first thing in the morning. Avoid fake news. Con conspiracy theories. Be careful about your time on social media. I know I'll have to explain this to the older generation. Don't suffer from FOMO syndrome. You know what FOMO is? Ask any young person around you. Fear of missing out. I tell you what, focus on God's word. Now, I, I need to conclude because my, my time is up. But I... I, I I want to come back to a scripture that I read right in the beginning, and I said I'm going to come back to this. It's in the book of Hebrews. I wish I had more time to take you on a journey through the book of Hebrews because the author here uses at least five maritime metaphors. He uses nautical narratives to explain something to us, and, and maybe I'll go through them very quickly, and I hope this will help those who are all at sea and 
did not fathom <laughs> the meaning of these metaphors before. <laughs> Thank you, John. Now, in, in Hebrews, and I, I'm not following a, a, a chronological order here, but in, in chapter 11 and verse 12, there's the first connection there where he speaks about the fact that uh, Abraham's descendants were like the sand on the seashore. And then in, in chapter 10, 38, he describes somebody who shrinks back or draws back in fear from faith. Now, very interesting, that phrase, shrinks back, is the same Greek word that Greek, uh, that seafarers would apply when they lowered the sail. You see, when you draw back from faith, it's like lowering a sail, you won't get anywhere. Then in chapter 4, 16, he speaks of the help we can receive from the throne of grace. That word is only used twice in the New Testament in Hebrews, and go and read about this in Acts 27 and verse 17. It's when Paul was on a ship in a storm at a time that the ship was about to break apart. And it says there that they, um, they uh, helped the ship. And, and this is, this is the, the same word that is used in Hebrews. And that word help literally means this. And it's a whole description. You can go and read about it. When a ship was about to break up in a storm, they would pass ropes under the hull. And then they would tie those ropes together to secure the ship and to prevent it from uh, uh, falling apart. In, uh, the modern term, they still use that, is frapping. Think about wrapping. They would wrap that ship in those ropes and make sure that it's not falling apart. And here's what I wanna say to you. You can expect help from God in the time of your crisis when you feel everything's falling apart. God will send those ropes of love and he will tie your life together and make sure that you do not go under. Amen. Hallelujah. Hebrews 2 and verse 10 and uh, 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 verse 1, he speaks about the danger of drifting away. What prevents a ship from drifting away? An anchor. So that brings us to the scripture that I read in the beginning, Hebrews 6 and verses 18 and 19, where, where um, hope is likened unto an anchor. And it says, hold on to the hope we have been given. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul. Sure and strong. I'm sure you've heard politicians and leaders use th these words. We are sailing through uncharted waters. Because it's true. We've never experienced anything like this in our lifetime. But here's another truth. While we're sailing through uncharted waters, we have an anchor. When the storm comes, we have an anchor, sure and strong. Cora and I have been privileged to, to visit Rome, and we, we do not usually have time to do all the, the sites that tourists usually go to. But one year, our host took us to the catacombs on the outskirts of Rome, where Christians used to hide when they were persecuted. And then when they take you down the catacombs there, you have all kinds of inscriptions on the rocks there. While they were hiding, they were writing things on the wall. And here's the one picture that you find again and again, and it's that of an anchor. When they were hiding among <laughs> dead bodies, they still had the hope as an anchor for their soul. In lockdown and in the pandemic, we have an anchor. Amen. And we need to, to hold on to that. Now, what is significant for me, he says here, it's an anchor for the soul. Where's your soul? You see, you're a three-part being, spirit, soul, body. Your soul is the seat of your emotions, of your will, of your intellect. And here's what, what God says. While other people's emotions 
are running like a roller coaster, you have an anchor for your emotions, for your thoughts. God will quiet your thoughts if you hold on to that hope of hope. A last scripture, Hebrews again, chapter 10 and verse 23. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. The rope of hope. You cannot see the anchor but you can see the rope. Hope is about the unseen. You might not know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. Amen. Let's stand. I want to pray for you. <laughs> It's not the normal prayer where I can just say, okay, I'm going to pray that you get hope. <laughs> because how does hope come? His word brings us hope. You heard the word, but you need to keep on hearing the word. That's what Hebrews says. Keep on hearing so that you don't drift away. You need to keep God's word before you. I want to encourage you to get serious about the Word of God. That's why we're so passionate about Bible school, because we know what the Word does in people's lives. We know that God's Word has the power to produce that. So I want to not just pray for you, but I want to challenge you to go and get serious with the Bible, with God's Word. Amen. Father, we thank you today that we could hear from your word what true hope is. It's not wishful thinking. It's not a daydream. It's not passive waiting. It's not a hype. <laughs> it's the surety of your promises. Because you never change. And we can hold on to the rope of hope. I thank you, Lord, that when we go out of here, not only will our hearts daily be filled with your word and daily be filled with hope, but that we will become dispensers of hope. That we will help others to see where hope lies. And thank you, Father, that you've been faithful through all of this time. And you will not change. Thank you, Lord, that we know, not just for now, but for eternity. And we hold on to that. While every head is bowed, every eye is closed, I want to say another prayer. As for those who might not be sure about their relationship with God and you're not sure that if you were to die today where you will spend eternity there's hope for eternity and it's found in Jesus he's the hope of all nations he's your hope he's your hope of glory and if you are not sure about where you will spend eternity you're not sure about your relationship with God. Whether you are watching online or whether you are present here. But if that is you, I want to pray for you. So in this auditorium, if that is you, quickly just slip up your hand and say, please include me in that prayer. I want to make sure that I'm a child of God. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Just raise your hand right now. And we're going to include you in that prayer, even on the balcony upstairs. Thank you, Lord. Now I'm going to pray a prayer for you. And then if you raised your hand, I want you to come and meet me here after we close the service. Because we wanted to pray with you personally. Will you do that? Okay. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you that right now, that we can pray this prayer on behalf of those 
who have indicated that they need Jesus in their lives. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray this out loud. If you will follow me, everybody do this out loud. And if you watching this, do the same thing. Say after me, Heavenly Father, I come to you right now, just as I am. I confess I'm a sinner and I need a savior. You are my only hope. Jesus, I invite you, come into my life. Cleanse me, forgive me, and make me brand new. I confess with my mouth what I believe in my heart, that you died for me, you were raised from the dead so that I can live eternally. I receive the gift of eternal life by grace, through faith, I'm now a child of God and I will follow you for the rest of my life. Amen. Thank you. Well, go out and bring hope to a hopeless world. Amen. God bless you.